Washington Journal continues. Joining us from New York is Kellyanne Conway, the manager of the Trump Pence campaign. Thanks again for being with us here on C-SPAN. We appreciate it. Thank you, Steve. We're going to talk politics, but let me begin with the personal. Why did you agree to take on this job? I very much believe in Donald Trump and Mike Pence as the next president and vice president of the United States, Steve. They have the vision and the uh, character, frankly. They have the issue set that matches what Americans are asking for in leadership. And I think uh, Mr. Trump's ascendancy in the Republican primary, as extended through the general, suggests that people really do want a disruptor. They want somebody who will turn the tables over in Washington. Many people promised to do that. Many people have been in Congress for decades, originally promised to do that when they first got there. And it simply hasn't happened. Uh, we think after eight years of any party in power, we know that normally people want a change election. They want a change in, in government. But I also think that he's been able to ignite something that we just haven't seen in modern politics. And everybody from Mayor Rudy Giuliani who travels these rallies is that they just, they've never seen anything like it. They just see so many people in the actual venue and then thousands more in the, in the uh, spillover, either arena or on the jumbotrons, who just want an opportunity to be there, to listen, to be part of a movement. And it's incredibly exciting for someone like me who has always been, you know, somewhat suspicious of establishment politics in that uh, we just try to improve our margins a little bit here or a little bit there and never really put forward uh, messengers who have a credible, legitimate way to talk to the American people, connect with them and communicate them through a non-political lens. Um, I also have to say I have respect for Secretary Clinton and her decidedly political Washington, D.C. type of career. But at the same time, um, I have three daughters and a son, but I can't really say to my three daughters that this is a role model, um, somebody who shades the truth, somebody who is not been completely honest as reflected in the polls. I am all for a woman president, just not that woman. It's not a hypothetical, it's Hillary. And so that's very motivating to me as well. Is Donald Trump a role model? Donald Trump is a role model for many people. I have to say for me, he's been inc incredibly generous and incredibly engaged and respectful of me. I mean, he's promoted a woman to run his campaign, much like he's promoted women throughout the Trump organization um, for decades. And uh, if you walk around Trump Tower, you see many women fully um, committed to his principles, to his values, whether it's on the corporate side or now on the campaign side. And uh, I've always had a very respectful relationship with him. He's very funny. He's uh, very obviously very smart, a brilliant businessman. But he's also a great listener. And I think that is something that we often lack in politics, is that a lot of politicians just love to talk and not listen much. And we hear from them every two to four years when it's time to run some TV ads that themselves are disconnected from reality. And uh, if you see Mr. Trump on the trail, just in the last two days, Steve, uh, on Thursday, excuse me, on Friday in Philadelphia, engaging with African-American leaders, civic leaders and business owners, and then with the Hightower family. And then yesterday in Detroit, attending uh, what's billed as his first, uh, his first visit to a traditionally a black church. Um, Bishop Jackson and his congregation were incredibly generous welcoming Mr. Trump and us there. And he enjoys that. He very much enjoys listening to people and getting outside, you know, business deals and corporate stuff that, that has been his, you know, has really been his stock and trade for decades now very successfully. And I, again, I, you and I have seen many politicians over the years, right, left, and center. I think you lose some luster in that regard. You lose some connectivity with voters over time when, when you look at them just as voters and not as people. And so it's, he's got tremendous joy on the job. And when I think as just his campaign manager, um, Hillary Clinton has many gifts and many skills. But I, when I think of all the things that she is not and can never be as a presidential candidate, I see him responding to that and matching up that way very well. But when you talk about the tone and being a role model, Donald Trump uh, saying that he had some regrets, uh, but he didn't give anything, any specific examples of what he was apologizing for. Was it the tone, things that he had said during the campaign that now continue to dog your candidate moving into the general election? Steve, when Donald Trump expressed regret for having caused, quote, personal pain to anyone, the reason that it's nonspecific is because it, the minute that you start enumerating people and naming them, 
it sounds like you're excluding others who may have felt personal pain. And so he left it so that those who felt that personal pain would receive his expression of regret um, personally for them. And uh, whether he speaks to people privately beyond that is another matter. But I can tell you that uh, with, with the Donald Trump that you see on the trail expressing regret, uh, Donald Trump and, and Governor Pence running down to Louisiana when they saw people in need and, and saying no press, handing out diapers and formula and obviously water and food for those in need. That's what leaders do. Uh, going into places where a lot of you know, Republican presidential candidates have not been willing to go before. Frankly, we haven't even seen Hillary Clinton there lately. Going into the black churches, into the communities, speaking to um, communities of color where they live and, and just wanting to engage with them, whether they end up voting for him or not. He will have very much enjoyed that time uh, because we believe that the president of the United States should represent all Americans. And if you're going to represent all Americans, as he would as president, then you ought to be talking to all Americans while you're running for president. Let me follow up on some news over the weekend. Uh, Governor Mike Pence, Donald Trump's running mate, telling Chuck Todd on NBC's Meet the Press he will be releasing his tax returns this week. Do you see any scenario in which Donald Trump would release his before the November 8th election? Yes, if, this, if his lawyers and accountants told him that it's time to do that. He's under audit, and they've made very clear to all of us that he should not release them until those audits are completed, and we have to defer to them. Um, and I'm glad that Governor Pence will release his tax returns. He's not under audit. And, uh, and I, I think that you know, Governor Pence telling Chuck Todd of NBC that he'll be releasing his tax returns next week or so is really in stark contrast to the tens of thousands of emails that apparently were never released um, or were deleted uh, by Secretary Clinton from her private server, which of course is the big news of the weekend, Steve. We have the Secretary of State saying that she can't remember having classified briefings. She didn't know the C stood for confidential information, classified information. Goodness, we all know that. Uh, that she, now there's 17,000 more or so emails that weren't released it. We already know the 33,000 that were deleted. I mean, it just doesn't look good for somebody who is already seen as dishonest and untrustworthy by over 65% of Americans. Do you think Hillary Clinton's health is an issue this fall? Well, I'm not a doctor and she certainly is not my patient. So what I, what I don't understand is the campaign strategy of the Hillary tour from Hollywood to the Hamptons just shoveling in as much donor and lobbyist money as they can possibly do. And then up in the vineyard last night, Donald Trump's in Detroit uh, in a black church with Pastor, excuse me, with Bishop Jackson and his congregation and also meeting with others in Detroit. And she's in Martha's Vineyard last night raising money. That's her right, but the American people also have the right to, to see what these two candidates are doing as part of their campaign strategy. So I can tell you the man that I work for in this presidential campaign, uh, Donald Trump and also Mike Pence, his running mate, their stamina and their energy is unbelievable. It's very difficult for those of us who are younger than Mr. Trump to keep up with him most days. And that's just joy on the job. That's just somebody who enjoys being out there and wants to, you know, wants to fill the schedule up with as many opportunities to touch the voter as possible. Look at just this past week. I mean, the, the difference in the, the calendars, the difference in the way that Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump are scheduling their quote campaign events is pretty remarkable. She's raising money, not giving many speeches, and certainly no policy addresses like he did. And in the matter of 24 hours, he had been in Seattle at a rally of, again, thousands and thousands of people um, on a Tuesday night, the last week in August in Washington state. Then he, then he jetted down to uh, Mexico to meet with the president there up the same day to give a 10-point speech on immigration, 10-point plan on immigration, um, and then the very next morning, 9 a.m., back in Ohio to address the American Legion. So that's a candidate who actually wants to take his case directly to the people. So I think you contrast it to, it has nothing to do with health. It has to do a, a great deal with what is your campaign strategy and how do you spend your days? Do you spend your days with voters and in front of audiences who would like to hear your vision and your specific solutions uh, as president, or are you spending time in Hollywood, the Hamptons, Martha's Vineyard, raising money? Our guest is Kellyanne Conway, a frequent guest here on the C-SPAN Networks and now managing the Donald Trump campaign. She is in New York. She's a graduate of Trinity College, earned her law degree from George Washington University, longtime Republican strategist. This is her first national campaign. Let's get to your phone calls. Ken in Cincinnati, Republican line. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, 
Yes, uh, the thing I I think that well, will happen. I think Donald Trump will get a lot more African American votes than the main, mainstream media is giving him credit for. And if you compare his tax plan, which is to simplify it, compare that to Hillary's, which will uh, make it more encumbersome and actually will increase taxes on the middle class in her own words. I think once people realize this, and just based on that alone, there's no doubt that Donald Trump will get a lot more support from everyone from all demographic groups. Ken, thanks for the call. Kellyanne Conway. It's a great point that Ken from Cincinnati is making, Steve, in the following regard. He has figured out what many voters are discovering, which is this is a true contrast choice election. And the, I cannot think of a more stark choice on immigration, on the economy, on defeating radical Islamic terrorism, on education policy, on what to do next with the Affordable Care Act, otherwise known as Obamacare. And to Ken's point about, their, about Trump and Clinton's respective economic plans, I would just urge your viewers Go and look at them for yourself. Uh, a couple weeks ago at the Detroit Economic Club, Mr. Trump unveiled his uh, four-point or so tax relief plan, middle-class tax relief, uh, rolling back a lot of these regulations that are really strangling our small business owners and deterring others who would like to be entrepreneurs and achieve their American dream in this country from doing so. And uh, the idea that people are only going to go to the ballot box talking about style or tone and temperament and not facts and figures is folly. That is, that is wishful thinking on, on behalf of the Clinton campaign and her, and her supporters. Um, I always have my faith in the voters. That's been my business for 28 years, is what do voters and consumers think? What's important to them? And you know, Steve, from looking at all the polls, voters say what's important to them are jobs in the economy, everyday affordability, defeating terrorism here and abroad, education, healthcare, immigration, energy policy, infrastructure. And you will hear Mr. Trump continue to give policy speeches about all of the issues that Americans care about. People can go on the websites for Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump and look at the different plans, or they can listen at least to his plan because he actually takes his case to the people. But there's no question that she is calling for a massive tax increase, more regulations, no energy independence in this country. Uh, and when she talks about, quote, investments, that's a really long word for tax. Among the past clients for Kellyanne Conway, Newt Gingrich, who ran in 2012, serving as senior advisor and pollster. She's also worked for Representative Marsha Blackburn, Governor Mike Pence, and Congressman Steve King. Joe from Falmouth, Massachusetts, Democrats line. Go ahead, please. Good morning, Steve. Good morning, Kellyanne. Thanks for coming on. Hi. Kellyanne, do you think you should apologize to women for defending Todd Akin's comment in 2012 when he said that if a woman was legitimately raped, that her body had a way of avoiding pregnancy. Thank you. So I didn't defend him, and I think that the media just love to take one, one negative thing about somebody that's not verified and not true. I did not defend him. I was his pollster in the primary. He won the primary. We did one poll for him, and he won the primary, and then we didn't work for him anymore, and I think the Senate committee itself wasn't very hopeful. Um, I know that Todd Aiken who I haven't talked to in years, has asked um, forgiveness of many people, and I'm sure from the Lord, and I hope that he has received it from those uh, for whom he's asked it. But uh, I never agreed with those comments. I don't agree with those comments. And, uh, and, I, and it's, it's just very unfortunate that in the age of uh, instantaneous attacks and no verification, that a comment like that could actually have legs. So thank you for raising it, even if it was meant to be a negative. Um, thank you for raising it so I can actually have a platform to clear the air for those who actually care about the truth. Darlene from Virginia Beach, Virginia, Republican line. Good morning. Good morning. Uh, yes, my name is Darlene Quinn, and um, my mother lives in Wilmington, Delaware, and she passed away some 10 years ago. But during the time of all the publications of Mr. Trump's books, she bought those books, and she said, Darlene, she says, mark my words, he'll make a wonderful president if he ever decides to run. So we were at Taj Mahal, one of the casinos, and Mr. Trump, with his entourage, happened to be walking through the aisles, and my mother always did the end 
uh, slot machines. That man, Mr. Trump, took the time to stop and talk to her and acknowledge her. I will grant you that there was a lot of money that she spent on that, but she also <laughs> won money. My comment is that my mother is gone now, but my wish is that we give Donald Trump a chance and that we have an optimistic view just like him. I have the highest respect for that man right now because he has not increased our deficit. He has raised money for the Republican Party, and I'm looking forward to casting my vote with many of my dear senior citizen friends. I want to say that I have the greatest regard for him, and I am looking forward to him taking over our country and using uh, uh, the people that are running his campaign in the White House because everybody is making wonderful sense to me. Darlene, thanks for the call. If we had time, I'd ask you how she won money in the casino, but you know, <laughs> that's another topic for hey, another day. Hey, Steve, <laughs> Steve, I will tell you that it sounds like Darlene's mother or mother-in-law was uh, right next to my two grandmothers uh, at the slots, no, no doubt. But uh, <laughs> but I think what I think the anecdote that Darlene says is such an important one because it suggests, and I don't know her politics and certainly her mother and mother-in-law's politics, but it does show you the crossover appeal that Donald Trump has as a cultural figure, as a decidedly non-political person and you've heard from his children and from others who have known him for decades certainly I've witnessed it firsthand many times he loves being with people he loves stopping and talking to them looking in their eye genuinely interested in what they have to say uh, there's a great uh, anecdote from when governor and mrs. Pence had come to Bedminster originally for a first meeting when mr. Trump was uh, discuss you know talking to a few people who would maybe his running mate and he, Mr. Trump found out that their daughter, Charlotte, who's 23, had accompanied them on the trip from Indiana. And she was not at the dinner the night before between the two couples, the Trumps and the Pences. And he insisted that they have breakfast that morning and just peppered Charlotte Pence, 23 years old, with all kinds of questions about millennials and her life. That's, a, that's just a great example, as is the casino example, of how he genuinely enjoys uh, being with people. I've seen him firsthand at the construction sites. I've watched him w with folks at rallies. I see him taking the time um, when, the, when the plane is waiting, and I'm sure that everyone's exhausted except him, of course, and, and he just thrives on this. And guess what? People see it and they love it because they want a candidate who looks like they want to be with voters, who's not just sequestered again with donors and lobbyists and handlers and, um, and consultants. So. That's how he'll continue to run his campaign. That's not going to change over the next two months, Steve, and I'm glad that people like Darlene see that. As you know, uh, during the primary, before you joined the, joined the campaign, uh, Donald Trump said that he didn't consider uh, Senator John McCain to be a war hero. He won the Republican primary in Arizona last week, Kellyanne Conway. This is the headline from the Washington Post. John McCain wins the primary and promptly gives up on Donald Trump. Not sure if you've seen it, but this is a new ad by the McCain campaign. Let's watch it and get your reaction. My opponent, Representative Ann Kirkpatrick, is a good person. But if Hillary Clinton is elected president, Arizona will need a senator who will act as a check, not a rubber stamp, for the White House. Ann Kirkpatrick won't oppose higher taxes. She won't oppose more federal spending. And she won't oppose increased debts that slow economic growth. She won't offer alternatives of trust in the innovation and industry of the American people and create jobs with a future. I will. She won't insist that I look From the John McCain campaign and Kellyanne Conway, as you can see in that ad, already saying that he wants to be a check for the possibility of a uh, Hillary Clinton presidency. Are we seeing that in other states and are you concerned? I'm not concerned, and I think every senator or Senate candidate, rather, Steve, needs to run the race they want to race. I would note that for all the hand-wringing uh, that people have, a, that Donald Trump's dragging down these Senate candidates, in some of these states, as the polls showed just this week, the public polls, we're actually running ahead of some of these Senate candidates. And so I believe they all have to run the race they want to run. And I think that for people who have been in the Senate for decades, that they definitely need to find the message they think 
is is most attractive to their voters based on the fact that they've been in Washington for a very long time and the top of the ticket has not been in Washington very, for a very long time. And frankly, in a field of 17 presidential aspirants on the Republican side, the one true non-politician um, with a great you know, business background, success in, in not outside of politics, outside of Washington, actually prevailed. It, that's called causation, not coincidence. That's what people wanted. So I have enormous respect for Senator McCain, and, I res and that includes respecting the way he wants to run his campaign. Let's go to Mike in Safety Harbor, Florida, Republican line with Kellyanne Conway of the Trump campaign. Good morning, Mike. Yes, good morning, she's been Good morning, Mr. Conway. Uh, I wish you didn't uh, show Mr. McCain prior to my uh, my ability to speak, because now I have to go off my message. Uh, uh, Mr. <laughs> McCain isn't necessarily isn't necessarily he is he 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 was wounded in combat and and did serve as a prisoner of war. That should be commended. But his entire body of work is not necessarily one for the American people. If you want to go and Google Google images. He can be seen meeting with the same people uh, that are responsible for the creation of ISIS months later. Um, that's out there. Um, regarding Mr. Trump, now, I, I am a 41-year-old man. I've been a Republican for the last four or five years. I was a Democrat for uh, all the way prior. Uh, never really thought much of it until, obviously, this past president, who I did vote for the first time, and then I became aware of the progressive agenda, which has scared the daylights out of me. And now I've, I'm, I'm actually a Rand Paul, Ron Paul guy. Rand was my choice. But now going back, like I said, I've been, I've been conscious of Mr. Trump for virtually my entire life, probably since I was in middle school. And he's always been a capitalist. He's always been an outsider who had to play the game. Whereas someone like Miss Clinton with her, I didn't know what C meant, that and regarding the classified, that right there is the epitome of not only her mentality and the way she would govern, but just her overall criminal mindset. I mean, the way that she has no problem, and you can track the entire course of her life. When you look into Mr. Trump's background, you have all these, these stories of, him going out of his way and helping. I was actually, I'm, I was actually surprised because I was initially holding my nose and going to vote for Mr. Trump because of some of what I was getting from the media. Because again, they've they've attached on one thing he may have said without the greater context and ran with it, and it starts to work when it's constantly being. You know, shut down your throat. Mike, I'm going to jump in. Thank you for your call. Your comment from Florida. We'll get a response. Yes, thank you very much, Mike and Steve. So he said a few things I'd like to address. The last point he made about um, if he if you hear something so often and so f frequently in the media, then you start to believe it's true because how could it be on TV constantly if it's not true? I remind everybody, nobody's under ever under oath when they're on TV. And uh, so people just repeat things. I think uh, conclusions in search of evidence. And look, we've had many stories in the last couple of weeks alone, including a front page New York Times story, where basically journalists are now admitting, Steve and Mike, that they have suspended all forms of objectivity, that Donald Trump, quote, you know, pushes the limits of objectivity. And some people feel duty bound to just stop him, even though their journalistic integrity and their journalistic obligation indeed are to cover the race fairly. I mean, one area they don't cover fairly at all is that it's just the, it's just the amount of coverage that Donald Trump receives relative to Hillary Clinton. And I know he's out there actually talking to voters and she won't, she disrespects your profession so much, Steve Scully, that she won't even give a press conference. I think we're up to 273 days now. Um, so I know there's less opportunity to interview her, but she's also kind of boring and she, Americans see her as dishonest and not trustworthy. So we get most of the coverage. We're also the ones going out and talking to the voters every single day. So there's more to cover. But I would remind everybody that the media do have an obligation to be a sort of more fair in the coverage, but also more complete in the coverage, remembering there are two major party candidates actually running here. To Mike's other point, that he supported Rand Paul or any one of the other 16 Republicans in the primary, and that, uh, but that he sees 
Donald Trump as somebody who succeeded outside of politics. That's really key here. I'm not sure all the polls can completely capture people like Mike at this point, who's in a swing state like Florida, because there are many people still on the fence. They've decided not to vote for Hillary Clinton. They just can't bring themselves to do that. But they're still looking for a reason to vote for Donald Trump, and that's why he's out there talking about issues, talking about substance, bringing his case directly to the voters. We're going to continue to wage this campaign based on the substance of the issues that people like Mike and voters all across the country tell pollsters they expect and they deserve to hear. And we'll, we'll, hope, that, that we'll hope that Secretary Clinton uh, starts running a campaign that's similar to that. She gave one speech, she gave two speeches in the last two weeks. One was to the American Legion, not very well received at all. And the one the week before, she gave a speech about Donald Trump, not about health care or the economy or education or immigration or infrastructure. Uh, she gave us a radical Islamic terrorism. She gave a speech about Donald Trump in some websites. So we're very happy that people like Mike are at least seeing Donald Trump as the job creator, non-politician he's been, who now, as a candidate, continues to take his vo his voice and his message directly to the voters. Let, let me follow up on a quick point because it came up. You mentioned Donald Trump's uh, trip to Mexico City and he told reporters that uh, he did not discuss payment for the wall and the Mexican president tweeted out that yes in fact the Mexican president said we did talk about it and Mexico won't pay for it. What happened? Well they have a, di they have a difference of opinion there however I think Mr. Trump made very clear uh, in his speech in Arizona hours later that he will build the wall. It's part of his 10-point immigration plan, Steve. He will secure the southern border. He will build that wall, and Mexico will pay for it. That's his position. It's always been his position. He's running against the queen of flip-flops, and he has been very consistent in his position on the wall and other issues uh, during this campaign. So we, we really look at the positive aspects of that meeting, that really historic meeting with the president of Mexico, very graciously accepted his invitation to visit for a few hours there. And of course, you know, look, I, th I know everybody's very focused on illegal immigration, and that is absolutely one of the major issues that Mexico and the United States must address together. But there's also human trafficking. There's also drugs coming over the border. Uh, there's also the idea that a border protects the sovereignty of both Mexico and the U.S. But let's make very clear that a prosperous and safe Mexico benefits the United States, a prosperous and safe United States benefits Mexico. And, and I think that was the first of many conversations that these two leaders would have um, if Mr. Trump were president. We have about a minute left with our calls. Crystal, quick question from Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania on the Democrats' line, but please keep it brief. Um, yes, good morning, Steve, and good morning, Kellyanne. I'm just going to just name a couple reasons why I will never, ever vote for Donald Trump. One is the way he talked about the president throughout his um, presidency. Another is the alt-right um, campaign manager. Another is Steve Ailes, who's been charged with sexual harassment. Crystal, I'll stop you there. I think she meant Roger Ailes. We'll get a response. Kellyanne Conway. Sure. So um, I respect the fact that you are a Democrat and probably be inclined to vote for Hillary Clinton anyway, but that you're paying attention to the news stories. And I have to say, Steve, and to the caller from Wilkes-Barre, I, I respect every American's right to cast their vote or not to cast their vote, to refrain from voting um, as, as, they, as they feel fit. I mean, that's democracy and that's uh, freedom of speech, freedom of expression. At the same time, <clears throat> excuse me, when she talks about um, Mr. Trump and his, his talks about uh, whatever he has said about President Obama during his presidency, I would remind everyone to go back and review the tapes and the statements, but particularly in those debates. I mean, some of the most severe criticisms against President Obama came from Hillary Clinton herself and have come from Bernie Sanders since. And he won 22 states and millions of voters as a result of that, Senator Sanders did. So there's t plenty of criticism even from within his own ranks. But again, um, I would expect a registered Democrat to be leaning towards Hillary Clinton. I will tell you that most voters do not cast a vote based on personnel. They, they cast a vote based on the presidential candidates. And I would say the same on the Democratic side. We had, you know, really uh, very troubling reports about one or two of the chief aides to Hillary Clinton in the last couple of weeks. I won't mention their names because they're not on the ballot, but Hillary Clinton is. And the voters will have to go in and say, 
Who will be better for my pocketbook? Who will actually, who has called radical Islamic terrorism by its name and who has referred to them as our, quote, determined enemies in her convention speech in Philadelphia last month, or two, last month, two months ago? Who, who has, you know, who says that children who are in crumbling, failing schools deserve the same right to equality education and opportunity thereafter um, and who's for school choice and charters and homeschoolers and the public schools and the private schools and who frankly is not. So I like the fact that people have a real choice and a contrast and I and I, I will put your caller down in the in the Hillary Clinton campaign for Wilkes Bar, Pennsylvania, but I very much appreciate her perspective. And this morning, the New York Times, Neil Newhouse, your colleague, Republican pollster, saying it's the messenger, not the message, that's holding Donald Trump back in his advice, seize the debates. How critical will they be for the Trump campaign? That's a great, it's a, a, actually a great piece of advice from my friend and former boss, Neil Newhouse. Uh, he was my boss when I, my first job in polling many, many, many years ago and always has some great advice. So what Neil is actually conveying there, Steve, is very important. It's basically that the issue set actually favors Donald Trump. And you look at, I think the Weekly Standard wrote a piece about a week or two ago, and it was remarkable. It showed that in the last 200 and some polls taken on the Affordable Care Act, in about three or four of those 200 plus polls, a majority of Americans like it, think it's working for them, approve of it, have faith in it, and the other 100 and some did not. Uh, and so the issue set the idea that terrorism and national security has catapulted to, to the top of the list of voters' concerns, the idea that free market alternatives to education that we are, that of course Mr. Trump is talking about, middle class tax relief, that, that inf rebuilding our infrastructure, we soon will be talking about our child care plan. Um, and so all of that put together, Neil saying, look, the issue set benefits you, the message is yours and that these debates are going to be critically important because it will be the first time, Steve, that people see Hillary Clinton and Donald Trump side by side. And they will have to decide, who do I see as my commander in chief? Who do I trust to tell me the truth as president of the United States? Who's been in Washington for too long? Who's a total outsider? Uh, they, they will be able to assess them side by side. And that's really what the choice is. And I think this election more than any I can remember, Steve, it's almost like people think it's a referendum on Donald Trump, like we're just going to show up on election day, walk into the voting booth, there's going to be this huge lit sign of Donald Trump's face and a big yes or no uh, that you have to, you have to, no. You're going to walk into the ballot box where you vote Steve, and you're going to see Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton and, and down ballot and, and Gary Stein, excuse me, Jill Stein and Gary Johnson as well. But that it's a very important point because this is not a referendum on Donald Trump. This is a choice election. And if people feel that more millions more people in poverty and uh, fewer people feeling good about their health care coverage and a lot of folks not being able to find well-paying jobs or quality educations for their children or feeling less safe and less prosperous is a great idea, you should absolutely vote for Hillary Clinton. But we are vi taking the debates very seriously. They're fun for us. Kellyanne we've Conway, got a candidate. I, I, we know we've <laughs> got a candidate who's out there talking about issues every day. It's the best preparation for the debates. I'm, I'm going to stop you there because we're going to lose our satellite time. But Kellyanne Conway, Republican strategist and manager of the Trump campaign, joining us from New York. Thank you very much for being with us. We always appreciate Thank it. Thank you for having me, Steve. Thank you.